our children swim in that water and they get uh, skin rashes, uh, scabs, and things like that. We should have a hospital, we should have a school. We should have better housing. We should have clean running water. We pay the price for that. We pay the price for our people died out there exercising their rights. A lot of us in Winnipeg know this Manitoba Hydro mural. It presents an idyllic scene which reflects the perception many of us have of the supposed environmental friendliness of hydroelectric power generation. After all, Manitoba Hydro harnesses the natural power of our northern rivers. So what could be the problem? I'm Dr. Peter Kochiski. I'm a full professor in the Department of Native Studies at the University of Manitoba, and I'm originally from Manitoba. Having spent much of his career focused on Manitoba Hydro's dealings with indigenous communities in the northern part of the province, Kolchiski has a more informed take on the impact of hydro projects than many of us in the south do. People use the rivers for traveling, they use the rivers for drinking water, they use the rivers because the riparian wetlands are, you know, a very rich source of medicines and foods and uh, of uh, a habitat for animals. So it's quite insidious. You think you're building a dam and you're flooding an area and that's it but you're actually destroying the whole river that that dam is on, pretty much, or you're, you're making it behave, um, well, exactly the opposite of how it behaves in nature. He's referring in this case to the Churchill River Diversion, a system designed by Manitoba Hydro to feed the Churchill River into the Nelson River, to increase the Nelson River's potential to generate electricity. Kolchiski helped found a group which unites the academics studying the effects of hydroelectric development into an alliance with the people most impacted. Waniskatan is the Cree word for wake up or rise up, and Kolchiski found himself waking up when he learned the story of what happened to a sacred site on Footprint Lake in northern Manitoba. According to legend, these markings on a rock face are the footprints of Wasakichak, an ancient hero in the lore of the Nisichewayasa Cree. After Hydro's flooding submerged the footprints, divers removed the cutout sections of rock with them on it. They've since been returned and reattached a little above where they were originally, but Kolchiski remains appalled. So we basically took one of the most powerful indigenous sacred sites in northern Manitoba and desecrated it for money. It tells people, whatever you hold precious, your heartbeat, if we want to, for money, we will grab your heart and pull it out of your chest. Like, that's what we can do. It's an instance of a gross violation of people's spiritual rights uh, in, a, in a country that supposedly prides itself on its respect for human rights. Um, uh, that is a story that outrages me, I have to say. There are many stories of outrage from the Hydro Impacted or Waniskatan group. Rita Monius is from Pimichikamak, also known as the Cross Lake Band. She's a part of Waniskatan too. And back in 2014, she decided to take her outrage with her to the Genpeg Generating Station and make some tea, as she puts it. Genpeg is at the point where the west channel of the Nelson River flows into Cross Lake on Pimichikamak's traditional territory. And so, by camping out and making tea near the facility, Rita Monia says her protest was about coming home. Just to make sure that they know we are there and they have to do something about what the, the treatment they're giving us, our people, the injustices on the environment and stuff like that, the impoverishment, the homelessness, and uh, we got something out of it. One of the things they got out of it was an apology from the NDP government. Our government and Manitoba Hydro 
are committed to working with the leadership of Cross Lake and to build upon our relationship based on mutual respect, understanding, fairness, and cooperation. There is a lot to apologize for. With its GenPEG facility, in order to regulate Lake Winnipeg's levels, Manitoba Hydro fluctuates the water levels of Cross Lake in ways that are disruptive to the ecosystem and to a way of life lived by the Pimichikamak people for thousands of years. Kulchiski has seen it firsthand. Because the water levels are fluctuating so much, you have um, trees continually falling into the water. So if you set a net, you get branches, basically. Uh, continually, the commercial fishermen are challenged by the fact that, you know, they can get, their nets are constantly being ruined. And uh, it's dangerous traveling in the summer because you have deadhead logs. You have more than ever before, uh, thanks to hydro. And so your boat motor gets destroyed and you're stranded out somewhere in the middle of nowhere. And not only that, Kolchiski points out water gets released at unnatural times in the winter. You need the water levels to be high in the winter time because that's when people are heating their homes. That's when the biggest demand of hydro is. So the whole cycle of nature is absolutely reversed. You're holding back the water so that you can get as much flow as possible in the winter and then uh, by the spring you're starting to need less. And so that absolutely reverses the cycle. It also um, makes uh, the rivers virtually unusable. So you have it this high, and then hydro decide is releasing a bunch of water. So it freezes up here, a bunch of water is released. You might have hanging ice or a very thin layer of ice that gets covered in snow. People were traveling that river all their lives, suddenly go on it, and their skidoo falls through, and people have died that way. And Manitoba Hydro concedes that studies of impacts from their projects and the way these impacts were dealt with don't match contemporary expectations. In a statement provided to APTN Investigates, Manitoba Hydro said, Developments such as the Churchill River Diversion were undertaken prior to modern environmental assessment practices, consultation standards, and understandings of Indigenous rights and interests. Substantial efforts have been made over time to address impacts associated with past developments. Rita Monius remembers what the water used to be like. The water was clear, pristine, beautiful. You can play in it. Look as far as you can see, because we, we saw underwater before, and it was uh, clean. There were no dangers in it. Like, you couldn't hit a, a rock or something because it was visible. And now our children swim in that water, and they get uh, skin rashes, uh, scabs and things like that. And then we have to make sure that they take a shower right after, a bath or a shower right after they, uh, uh, they swam. And uh, the water stinks. And, you know, you have to smell it yourself. Like if you're walk, walking your grandchild or your ch child home, you can, when they're walking beside us, we can smell that that unbearable, unbearable uh, odor from what has been uh, washed on them from that dirty water that they're using right now. When Cross Lake was signed on to the Northern Flood Agreement in 1977, they, along with the other signatory indigenous communities, were promised that mass poverty and mass unemployment would be eradicated. The Northern Flood Agreement was meant to compensate communities impacted by Manitoba Hydro's Churchill River Diversion and Lake Winnipeg Regulation Projects. Communities were also promised clean running water. Mass poverty and unemployment have not been eradicated in Cross Lake. There is running water there, but there are issues. Here's a photo Rita Monius sent APTN Investigates of her husband Tommy Monius disposing a slop pail because they don't currently have running water in their home. There are few who would argue the Northern Flood Agreement was a success. It turned out that that's a very expensive promise to have made, and quickly the federal government realized it was too expensive. But Pimichikamak is refusing to let go. Why would I come into a new agreement when you haven't even honored the first agreement in the first place? That's coming up.
The Northern Flood Agreement was an attempt to define compensation for the damage caused by the Churchill River diversion. It was signed in 1977 by Manitoba Hydro, the governments of Manitoba and Canada, and the Northern Flood Committee Incorporated. The Northern Flood Committee was made up of community members and financed by the federal government. It was mandated to represent the interests of five bands. And Professor Kolchiski says saying no to the Churchill River diversion was not on the table. They were told the project is going ahead. There's no question about that. You can't negotiate for no project. You can negotiate for compensation. And after it was signed, Kolchiski says the federal government realized it had a problem. The problem with the Northern Flood Agreement was the government thought it was too generous. The federal government um, makes an open-ended commitment. We will ensure that all of these communities uh, have access to potable water that meets the federal government's health and safety standards for water. That was an open-ended commitment. You're, you might lose your drinking water from your river. We're going to make sure that you have the facilities so that you all have good drinking water in your communities. Turned out that that's a very expensive promise to have made. And quickly the federal government realized it was too expensive. So what happened to the Northern Flood Agreement? Kolchiski explains. So a series of implementation agreements were negotiated. Four of the five communities signed implementation agreements, supposedly to replace the Northern Flood Agreement. And one community, Cross Lake, Pemichikamek, refuses to do so um, and has still insisting that they implement the Northern Flood Agreement. And with a promise to eradicate poverty, it's understandable why a First Nation would want to hang on to the Northern Flood Agreement. We met Tommy Monius's wife, Rita, earlier in the show. Until a few months ago, Tommy used to be chief in Cross Lake. He's 66 years old and a runner. And even though he lost the last election, he remains passionately engaged in the community's struggle. It says the Northern Fund Agreement says to eradicate mass poverty and employment, and, and, and employment. We have about 65% of our people are on welfare. And the hydro bills sure don't help anyone get a leg up in Pimichikamak. When we pay hydro bills for five to six hundred dollars a month or more, while in Winnipeg, they pay maybe $175 a month. Then you go farther down the states, it gets cheaper. And Hydro just got approval to raise the rates up here even more. Tommy Monius's friend Jackson Osborne showed us one of his incredible Hydro bills. This one is 18,291. Uh, and how is it that you owe them that much? I didn't pay my bill. Oh. Out of protest or? Well, one way is out of protest, plus they owe us money. Yeah. They haven't implemented the Northern Flood Agreement. But these are a treaty agreement, it's a treaty. So this to them is nothing. Like I can send this bill to Prime Minister Trudeau who paid for us. So why should, why should we pay this? They should pay for us. They look after us, they say they look after us, but they don't. So that's how much I owe. If they don't pay my bill, they cut me off, but the law is they, do, they, can't, they can't cut you off during wintertime, that's what we're told. But in summertime, I don't know, I might be homeless. <laughs> For Osborne and Monius, being billed this way adds insult to the injury of what's been done to their environment especially since, as Monius puts it, they're paying another way too. We pay the price for that. We pay the price for our people died out there exercising their rights. Okay? My brother and my stepbrother died out there exercising their right to fish, to hunt, to gather. Okay? That's basically when you take a look at it from my point of view. Okay? It's called cultural genocide. We're truly being extinguished by not able to go out there. Our young kids still trying to go out there. I will show you some pictures what happens in the winter. Our skittles, their skittles get stuck out there. Some of them will not able to survive out there. Okay, so that's the result of Manitoba Hydro being in our territory. So this place there is for me is very emotional. 
Jackson Osborne knows the price being paid all too well. Encouraged by his late father, who worked for Manitoba Hydro, Osborne has been documenting the changes to the water since 1988. And he remembers what it was like before Genpeg began controlling water levels on Cross Lake. Before Hydro, the water was so beautiful. It was so clear and blue. You want to shoreline, you just go up your hand and drink water. No problem. And you can swim anywhere. And you can travel on boat. No problem. You're not, you, weren't, you weren't scared of the water going up and down. The water at that time was stable. And so in Pimichikamak, a life of being in the water and on the land has been greatly diminished. And as current chief David Monius sees it, the community has not only had their traditional lifestyle virtually destroyed by Manitoba Hydro, but they are not getting the benefits they ought to be. We are being shortchanged in terms of what the benefits are. We should have a hospital, we should have a school, we should have an arena, you know, all these other recreation activities and so forth. We should have better housing, we should have clean running water, we should have um, hydros that are free because they're living off our land and uh, they're utilizing them, they're manipulating our waterways and so forth. That destroys our livelihood, the fishing and the wildlife that's out there. And yet, in spite of not getting what they need to get a leg up, Chief David Monius isn't letting go of the Northern Flood Agreement. So we expect people to, uh, to honor the agreement. It's a contractual agreement. It's, it's our right and our entitlements are written in there. And we should get those things. We shouldn't have to fight for those things and we shouldn't have to negotiate those things. Why would I come into a new agreement when you haven't even honored the first agreement in the first place. Why would I trust you to do that again? What is Pimichikamak getting from Hydro in compensation currently? They're only providing about $8 million annually through grant funding. And that's not enough to compensate. So the decision to not sign an implementation agreement nullifying the Northern Flood Agreement hasn't exactly paid off, yet. But as Professor Kolchiski points out, the Northern Flood Agreement is considered to be a treaty. In my view, there's something unconstitutional about the implementation agreements. If the Northern Flood Agreement is a treaty, you know, 1982 uh, uh, treaties became constitutionally protected. The, the Northern Flood Agreement meets every legal standard of being a treaty if we apply the CWE case at the Supreme Court of Canada. Its criteria for a, a treaty would perfectly fit the Northern Flood Agreement. And Eric Robinson, while being a minister in the House, said the Northern Flood Agreement's a treaty. So I think the, that um, the implementation agreements may be unconstitutional. But in the immediate sense, for Chief David Monius, the community's lack of resources to care for its people weighs heavily on him. So they're always, we're always fighting something, right? And it really makes me mad, you know, excuse me. Because I see the people out there, right? I visit the people at the hospitals. I hear their cries. I go meet families that we brought in a box so they can be buried here. But they're taken out of here to go die over there, away from family. And government won't even come to help us, let alone hydro. And that's just that's something to me, on a personal level, it really gets to me. What might a better deal look like? Kolchiski points to the Pays des Braves, or Peace of the Braves deal, brokered by Hydro-Quebec, the province of Quebec, and nine Cree communities. The money we were paying should come through revenue streams. That is, there should be money being paid every year. The Peace of the Braves model in Quebec is money being paid every year. After 50 years, they're not done. 
the, the, the presumption is they will renegotiate a new piece of the Braves at whatever value seems significant at that time. And with inflation, you know, probably be a higher value and will continue indefinitely as long as those hydro dams are running. We don't have that model in Manitoba and we need to go there. One revenue stream is river rentals. They're paying the river rentals to the provincial government. A significant portion of that should be being paid to the communities on the rivers. You have a revenue stream through the partnership agreement, so some degree of the profits could be paid for the communities. You could also have hydro subsidizing the electricity rates of the indigenous communities, which the Public Utilities Board mandated hydro to do, and hydro took them to court so as not to have to do that. And Kolchiski says, in this day and age, the bush life people have lived for millennia in the North deserves more respect. Pandemic and global warming are starting to help us realize that humanity itself needs different options, different kinds of ways of life to face the kind of uh, unprecedented challenges that we face. We may be in a situation where the bush way of life becomes one of the major options for our species. <laughs> <laughs>